So, incentives is one of the things you have my question about, right? Um, what are your questions about incentives? Okay, so Phil has any questions? Jeremy, why don't you come up and draw a cast for us? You bet. No, <laughs> oh, no, no. no. I'm just watching how uh, uh, the cat That's what I was doing. I'm glad you started doing that with cats. Uh, 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 I have a, a bunch of questions. <laughs> sure, go, Brad. You got cats. Um, one of them is like, oh, are you going to do manual or atomic? Oh, sorry, manual or automatic finality? Whether or not like a node has to explicitly finalize decisions, or whether a node could a node to do it implicitly, they, they look kind of different slightly. It's actually simpler, yeah. uh, but um, then you will finalize things without knowing it, and um, you'll have to. And, and, and basically, like the way that the spec works right now for automatic values, you have to ignore messages when they exhibit too many business defaults. So you only show. So imagine if your fourth choice rule only ever saw less than a third visit defaults, because you would filter out any messages that were show you more than a third. As soon as you see visit defaults, do you want to trash the corresponding? Yeah, but that's separate from the fourth choice rule. It's like a, that's more on the incentive mechanism. And like ejection can be part of the consensus protocol. Um, so, uh, b basically, um, uh, I would say something like, oh, a Byzantine fault corresponds to uh, some behavior that a node has on the, could have on the network, like an arbitrary behavior, but we look at that only through the effects that, they can, that it can have on protocol following nodes. And we can do fault tolerance analysis from like just thinking about, you know, what faults are. But um, the question is whether the node's protocol states themselves are aware of this notion of Byzantine fault. Yes, right? that's what I'm saying. So, and, and the answer is like, oh, if if you do make them aware of the Byzantine fault, then like, um, then it's then, then if the incentive mechanism is a function of protocol states, then it may have more information than otherwise, right? Yeah. And so it might be better, but it might be possible to. Put together evidence of Byzantine faults, even for protocols that aren't designed specifically for protocol states to like exhibit them and or like to sh to show exactly which ones are the faults. Or just in
not show your full torso and you connect your ears, show too many faults. Because then, because that might reverse blocks that you finalize at some level of fault tolerance. So if some block ends up having some level of fault tolerance, then if there are more than that number of faults, it could be that you reverse that block. And that would mean, that would like undermine the notion that it was finalized. And so like those, there's like simple way to like prevent that if reversion is just not allow the full choice rule to see messages that exhibit too many visible defaults. What is that with the new Let's say uh, Yeah, I mean, it does, absolutely. Safety safety has to do with, like, the future states that don't have too many faults. Exactly. Yeah, that's, the def that's kind of the definition. Yeah, but this is not just ignoring the messages. Exactly. But you have to ignore the messages from the, if there's too many Byzantine faults. You can't show your fourth choice rule any number of Byzantine faults. Uh, I'll end around by that kind of respect. Um, Why would we ever want to show the fourth choice rule a message with a fault that we can detect? done like with a transaction as opposed to at the four choice rule level um, because like oh there's there's all sorts of information about you know his behavior here that isn't potentially being penalized in this in the state of the chain um, but you know at some point you can include the information in the justifications and have a rule in the four uh, and have the four choice rule be aware of what is finalized, or you can include them in transactions and allow the four choice rule to not be aware of what's finalized. So if you you could you could show in, you could give the four choice rule all, all this false information, but it, but if it doesn't know what blocks are finalized, it might revert them as a result. Like the ones that like reach like a third fault tolerance, for example, it might be reverted if more than a third. Faults are shown. So, and with so with manual finality, you, you kind of would explicitly finalize blocks, and then you and you would like feed the four choice rule another argument, which is the last finalized block, and then it would sort of start the four choice rule from there, uh, as opposed to just. So by manual, do you mean that the validator operators? Decide to move it up, or what? No, no, what do you mean like by manual? That runs and it detects safety, and then flags the block as finalized, and then and then passes that argument to the fourth choice rule, which now will no longer revert. So you have to like actually detect safety, and then just make an explicit decision, which will like correspond to like you know an operation in the state. So detecting safety, do you mean consensus safety or estimate safety? Uh, well, I mean estimate safety, but like you know we know that that entails consensus safety. So in this in this model, like things in the automatic model, the only reason why that's necessary is to display to users what's finalized, you know, so that so that they know what their transactions are final. Well, it's not just the checkpoint state, right? Oh uh, uh, yeah, that that's all that that, that, that that's also true. Uh, but but you can also we can also we can already forget everything that we know won't be relevant for the four choice rule in the future. Um, uh, which is already kind of a potentially kind of a lot. Um, um, because like from, because, because basically like we are at, no worries. Um, so if you're at a particular protocol state, like conceivably you would know all the information that's required for you to visit the future state. Um, and if there are, if for every time, every time you go down some, uh, bifurcation where you, you know, no longer can achieve certain protocol states that you know I think at least some of those cases will will, will, will will correspond to no longer needing to no longer being able to revert at least if you know further bifurcations that correspond to finalizing blocks
Yeah, but uh, but the, from the user's point of view, is like, oh, I get to ship my goods to this customer, or, uh, because the transaction will be reverted. Um, so it's like it, the, I think of it more uh, from the point of view of like automatic finality, as a service for people who need to make decisions outside the protocol, mm. as opposed to for the protocol itself. So I'm asking both. Yeah. Both cases. Uh, so, but I, 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 I bet I bet that we can I, I bet that we can forget all the time. Even when we're not having, when we don't have your final finalized event. Um, so, in your estimation, which is easier to implement? I think I think uh, automatic finality is easier to implement. But notably, we have implemented manual finality in the in the in the prototype. Nate should maybe talk about it because he's. Yeah. Yeah. So. The guy who did that. Like the argument for why you can't revert blocks is finalized because it's where you're going to get the the, the process of that. Um, yeah, I mean I guess it requires implementing an API tool, but it kind of seems like to me that uh, uh, doing so is necessary to be used for to make a protocol that's really useful to users. Oh, of course. Yeah, but so, but whether the fork choice rule knows about the finalized stuff yeah, that's the is, is a question, yeah. Okay. Because if you stop it from seeing more than a third fault, then any blocks that receive more than a third fault first, you know, will be the ones that that it never reverts. Sorry, any block that is more than a third fault tolerant. Which I guess would be the same as if you're running your safety oracle. If we had an ideal safety oracle, and, and you ran it all the time. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so it's like more efficient at finalizing stuff because you don't need to do any computation. But what you need to do instead. Is Instead, you need to check for Byzantine faults whenever you receive a message. But that doesn't necessarily solve the protocol, <clears throat> because if you don't have all the dependencies for the message, you make it wait anyways. And when you do have all the dependencies, you can check in all at one time if it's an equivocation. Or like, I'm pretty sure of one. Because it's either, a new, it's either a new latest message for this validator, or it's not. And it, you basically check if it's a new latest message. And if it's not, then it's an, obviously an equivocation. So you only need to do that one operation of checking whether it's a new latest message. And it has to be like new latest via just one step, right? It has to be like the next sequence number. And so if, so if, the, next, if the next message you see from the validator isn't the like next sequence number uh, and pointing to this last message that you have from them, then it's like an equivocation. Um, you may be able to detect equivocation even before having all the dependencies resolved by seeing like two messages with different pointers with the same sequence number, for example. Sure. But that's kind of a over optimistic, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's like, oh, right now, I'm only really considering protocols where, or protocol states where we have all the dependencies of all the messages, rather than, you know, uh, hashes without the things they resolve to being actually there. Um, so I don't know, I think automatic finality is more elegant. Manual finality is um, potentially... So my, my only potentially reason more for choosing automatic was because I didn't want to have a human involved. If there's, oh, no, there's human no human involved there's no in human. either one, then I'm ambivalent. And, and mm -hmm. I would say yeah. to Mike Birch, go talk to you and have him figure yeah. something out. Yeah, so, so, so here's kind of like some thoughts that like may, it may, it might make me question why automatic finality may not be the best. Okay. Not every time that you see a set of messages that shows more than some number of faults, will it actually revert the blocks that were safe at the, for that number of faults? And so the, me the method for enforcing atomic finality is kind of overly aggressive. It just like really filters out anything that is, shows more than some number of faults. Even, even though that stuff might not revert uh, in, uh, in revert finalized block, and so it's somewhat less, potentially less forgiving, because it might forever ignore a validator, because showing their messages would show some things in their dependency that show too many faults, even though including those and showing them as a four-choice tool would actually not cause a reversion of anything that's finalized. Yeah, I see. You explore fewer protocol states, but you may shut down. Participation from validators, yeah. but only in the case where there's more than a third, some fault tolerance threshold number of faults. 
in which case you can actually you can readjust it by saying, oh look, well I'm just going to increase my fault tolerance threshold and include them. But you but that might come at the cost of some reversions also. Yeah, exactly. So the protocol can become more efficient by allowing some faults, um, but it's also more at risk. Right, but if you make your threshold very low, then that is less efficient than putting it high. But you're also, when you make it high, you're more at risk of, of well, no, hurting it's, something. It's, it's, it's kind of the other way, right? When you have the, when you have, the, well, I mean, there's only your efficiency, but when you have a threshold really low, that means that a small number of faults can cause consensus failure, but that makes it easier to achieve liveness. If you want to tolerate a hard, larger, to achieve liveness. So, like, liveness is easier if. You want to, to achieve less fault tolerance. Well, if you so want more fault tolerance, right? because you're ignoring a bunch of stuff. Well, so no, it's still it's still it's still liveness. Um, um, because like you achieve, actually, like you you end up achieving the safe states. But you may you may increase the likelihood of remaining this bivalent. But you said this said the fault tolerance though, then bivalency. No, much more likely. no, no, no. It's easier to get stuck if you're set the fault tolerance low. So imagine if we have like a fault tolerance of zero, then there's fewer ways to escape. So when when, when you gonna get stuck in the most minimal way, there's like no way to escape with like a Byzantine fault. Like Byzantine faults uh, allow you more ways to to be bivalent. Like us, another way to say it is like, oh, a state that's finalized for T faults is is going to be finalized for like you know. T hat less than T faults. Any faults at all would be bivalent. You can get. Well, you be bivalent no matter what. At any fault tolerance threshold. Yeah, at any fault tolerance. But but there's going to be states that are bivalent that are higher fault tolerance threshold that are not bivalent at a lower fault tolerance threshold. Oh, okay, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> but if you aren't bivalent at the higher one, you won't be bivalent at the lower one. Because commitments at a higher fault tolerance threshold are also going to be going to commitments at a lower fault tolerance threshold. Yeah. Because like if a block is safe against thirty faults, then it's safe against twenty. Kind of thing. So here's a procedural question. This discussion has been very in-depth. Yeah, it's very much really like yeah. it's very much like listening to the Casper stand-up. Um, I don't know if anyone else here has been to a Casper stand-up, and we agree. Are we addressing any of the questions? Yeah. Yeah. If you guys started, like where you guys are at right now, because you guys have done well, more. Hang on, we had some questions, very specific questions that we came on the that came on the presentation. Okay. These are so I had. Uh, there's no, we didn't mention anything about tie breaking properties. This um, that's, no, that's, a, that's already just a part of the specification. It's just, it wasn't in the presentation, but it's part of the spec. Okay. And then how many races should be allowed to be decided in a single block? That's an important question. My intuition was always that we would go wide, but not deep. So if you've got a bunch, a bunch of races all at the same level of nesting relative to your four comprehensions, you, you can put those all in a block, but not nested, 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 because you're, you're, allowing, you're allowing the computation to proceed like in giant chunks. That was my thought. Block versus? No, not necessarily one deep, but, but wider more than deep. Right, so I mean, any number of them can go down one, yeah. but you didn't want to go down too, yeah. was the idea. But um, yeah, the question on this one is, why not go deep? Why not let a validator say, well, I ran it and I got this trace. It's a perfectly valid trace. One of our options, we vote on it. And my objection was that that lets one validator decide the outcome of all of those races. Wait, you have more chance for other clients to get in and race. Right? So if you if 
so you if the so what you're saying is by only going one deep, there's a chance for newly deployed code to interact with it, and we get closer to yeah. that ideal where we pretend that there was some code all along with the rest of the block. Exactly. Yeah. That was, that was my thing. But both of you are saying basically it'd be more fair, in one way or another. Yeah. To only it's, go it's, one it's deep. a kind of fairness. That's it seems like fairness. Yeah. So Which is like a pretty, um, you know. I mean, norm like like fairness is, I'd say like a pretty ambitious thing to go for. Uh, I didn't say it was fairness generally. It's, it's a flavor of fairness. <laughs> um, it, it would be easier to do things like, for example, signature verification if you could go more than one deep. Although I guess you guys are having crypto ops also. Yeah. But imagine you had to do sequential computation for some reason, and a, a large number of it. I mean, I could see why. It might be a uh, pain to do it one at a time. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so, yeah right. But, but in, in, in those cases, it ought to be an optimization. Like if you can, if, if you can tell, you can tell there's no race at all. Like you can, yeah, you can run as far forward as you want when there's no races. Exactly. The question is how far you go past a race. Exactly. And um, the downside of, of this idea is that you'd have to persist phlogiston across um, blocks, yeah. whereas Joe's model was just one block. Yeah, yeah, which I much prefer. Right? In Joe's model, it would never have to be explicitly mentioned in the block what the phlogiston was. So it's less to track. That's if you only go one No, this is if... So if you go one deep, then it conflicts with what Joe said. Okay, that's what I Yeah, Joe allows you to go okay. until, you, until you got, until you, uh, yeah, it's like a... Is Joe's model guess. old if you go one deep? What? Does, does, I mean, Joe's model assumes quiescence is like, like fairly central to the model. If Joe's model, everything holds together, if you just go, if we talk about... Is there, there a way of modifying Joe's yeah, thing to account for it? There's a variant of Jonas which allows you to go one deep, I believe. So we should have we should have everyone. Maybe we could, could go over there and tell them, hey. Maybe we could grab Joe. But I mean, if they're discussing this stuff, then maybe we should let them decide it. Yeah. I've got another question. Yep. Uh, validator rotation and assignment. I also have a question of if there's like a limit to how many validators. Like right. Maybe. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. yeah. Basically, like where on the like trade off triangle do you want to be with respect to latency, number of validators, and overhead? Yeah. So, rotation and assignment. Um, assignment. There has been a proposal that people get an invalid. People who want to deploy validators get to deploy them into the namespace there or the region they're interested in. Um, but there's the risk of collusion that way if somebody wants to deploy a whole bunch of them into the same region to take control of it. Okay, one of the Well. Randomized means that you have to do work that you're not interested in. Mm, but shouldn't we have a separation of concerns between developer, user, and miner? Or like a validator? A miner may, may spin up a bunch of special purpose hardware just for validating, you know, uh, for example, high storage capacity uh, kinds of contracts. And now, and you give them high. But the but the but the more you the more you fraction up the validators into different like capacity groups, the lower the fault tolerance for any one of them will be as a you know in terms of the global percentage. But I understand what you mean. But well, when, when you want both, can you still just tailor for both? Not really, because you can 
you can target something by having a capacity. Yeah. Be like, oh look, buy storage and therefore overrun the storage town. Yeah. Okay. Right. Now you couldn't just have one specific purpose. Uh, so I mean, you know, I'm, I'm with Greg. I think you would have specific instances where you would want. I would prefer. So I would prefer. I would prefer. Let's, let's put this on pause for a second. While Joe's here. The question is about how many races get decided per block, or at least the depth of the race, right? You can do a whole bunch of them in parallel. Um, do we go one deep, or do we go all the way to quiescence? So, model doesn't force No, I, yes. I didn't make any assumptions on it. That's, that's what I thought. Yeah. 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 Um, so the one question is, Example does would, would help me. does phlogiston need to persist from one block to another one? That is an open question because um, one of the ideas for refunding a uh, flow that was used for computation would be oh, to, yeah, yeah. to do it at the end of every block, right? Um, and then whatever's left over is going to go collected and then, you know, like, the computations and whatever's left if there is any left, right? Um, but if a computation spans multiple blocks, right, because there's no limit on where the common mm -hmm. might occur, that model doesn't work. Um, so the only really the only other alternative since we're asynchronous is to just burn the remainder. Like no matter what you send essentially out is by a monk value. You, you don't you never get the refund. Which in some ways more certain than possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't make any assumptions. So, so if I understand no, it's this. Just, it's not, it, it's, you, can, you can go both what you can go either way. Uh, this should be this should definitely be recorded as something that needs uh, to be evaluated. We should write the expression. Go ahead. No, you're going to ask the question. You're putting the phlogiston in the top of space, right? Along with the yeah, when it's, when it's put down. Yeah. Yeah. And then essentially everything, like if you if you just do, um, if you just do like a resistance four, and nothing can ever interact with it, then it's put in the tuple space. And um, assuming that we have the storage model that we're talking about, eventually when the storage goes down, right, then you still have the leftover compute flow. Right? That's right. That's so right. across the tuple, on the other hand, when it runs out, one proposal um, had been to archive the state so that someone could come along later and provide more storage flow right. and a proof that it hadn't been restored before to bring it back up. My, my thing with that is that, like, You 
knew that was going to be the case anyway, right? Yeah, but I didn't assume that we'd be doing any flow rebuilds. Yeah, let's do a calculation. Yeah, we should, it should, this is something that we should yeah, yeah, sit down and scroll out. I'm, I'm not convinced, like, if, if you, you should, if you need that kind of determinism, then you structure your program as an SP4, not with an R in there. Right, I mean, that's, no, that's my opinion. So I guess the downside of of doing it only one deep is that it takes longer to run the program. The execution program will go over multiple blocks instead of just one. Validator rotation and assignment. What specifically was the question here? Well, how does it work? Um, well, considering we don't know what the regions are going to be, it's hard to tell how validators show up in the first place. Okay, well, um, for, so, in, so here's something that I can say. It was one of the sources of my questions. In, with the blockchain, if you have like a, some height at which the block, at which the validators change, then you know any any blocks that are made after that height, from that with that parent, will have a different validator set. Yeah. You know, if you have a concurrent schedule, um, you know how is that synchronization of the validator so, set managed? Yeah, you, in um, a blockchain, and then, and then uh, definitely the namespaces is another area where I have questions. You've got you know these parent-child links. And you can say everything after block height blah. But in a DAG, um, this one no longer has a specific block height because here it goes up two and there it goes up one. Um, so then the question becomes, um, you know, can we choose one of these and then say after every block sees this one in its ancestry and then we make it valid I think there may be one like uh, after this point they may accept it and then there's another one where we do the same thing and say it must be accepted sort of thing Yeah, so, th well, this is, if you're bringing in a new validator, how do you know when it's okay to accept its things? So I think if it, we, we pick a block here and say, if this hash is in your justification, then you may accept blocks from the validator. After this one is in your justification, you must accept blocks from the validator. So I think that could work, that, that sounds like a reasonable for validator induction. I'm not so sure about validator ejection. Um, also, what if the, the block is in your justification and not in your fortress? Yeah, that's another question also, yeah. Well, if it was orphaned, does that also count? This is a good question. Um, I wish Mike Birch were here. <laughs> yeah. I'm not the one who has paid most, much attention to this sort of thing. Anyways, Anyways I'm just giving it as a question because guys, I, yeah. I know it's something that, that's going to come up. Yeah, I think synchronization across the whole the well, we current schedule the top is that namespace. Is, is definitely the easier thing to do. Yeah. I mean, doing it in the top namespace is simplest because yeah, because everybody has to participate. Yeah. Um, but it's also, it also creates overhead and creates more stuff that everyone has to validate. It does. How often are we going to? I mean, there's a question of a if question there's also. some podunk little region over here that's having people come in and out all the time. Um, you may just want to have it with a couple of nearby regions and just get consensus between those. Um, 
So I guess even every, top, every validator has to know about it. But the so. top chain itself is concurrent, isn't it? It's not like the top chain has, like doesn't have this problem, unless you're going to use the sequential blockchain for that. Every validator has to know about every other one, so doing it at the top level is, I think, the fastest and simplest. But is the top level a sequential blockchain? No, it's just a namespace in which things happen. But yeah, every so, validator so even, has to participate. Even there, in. you're going to have to do validator rotation for the top level. At the top level. What? I just, I just no. mean the, 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 the validator is assigned to that namespace changing over time. Okay. So all validators are assigned to that namespace. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so, wait, but, but even, so even that, but even that completely requires that you understand how to induct new validators into the, into the, into the, uh, you know, having weight in the consensus protocol. So you, yeah, so, so I you, think you have this one should not be the, the uh, justification DAG, but the DAG that's being decided on is the block DAG. Um, so these two may, must. Um, rejecting one, um, I think we have to wait until there's finalization on that block because it might be rolled back. Unless people with valid, rotated validators subjectively at their own fault tolerance threshold. That's great. That yeah. Really yeah. <laughs> but I'm not sure if it's broken. For, projecting, <laughs> projecting, can we do a may ignore and a must ignore? I mean, that's not what I've done. I've never done that. I don't know. So I don't know. That, and that kind of seems like a two phase kind of thing, again, somehow. And I, I don't know. Well, the synchrony assumption, you could wait, you can do it in time. As opposed to with a, with a quorum. You wait, so, so imagine that you do have subjective validators at rotation, mm -hmm. and if you're, like, I mean, but don't you already not be guaranteed that your fault tolerance threshold is violated, so it's like whatever, yeah. no matter what? Well, exactly, that's what I'm thinking. So if your fault, so maybe you can only screw up if your fault tolerance threshold is violated yeah. at some point, yeah. Like it might work to say like once this block is finalized in my view, then I'll accept this block from this validator, and then like you know mm -hmm. if you end, ever end up. Mm, yeah, if you but, end but, up but 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 if someone else doesn't accept blocks from that yeah, validator, why would they? Uh, why would their fourth choice rule ever include that block, exactly. right? And then somehow you 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 those blocks will never will for some so reason never get in, right, yeah. even though they get it, even though they're in your fourth choice rule sometimes. Mm, so that so that's interesting, yeah. Or it makes me feel less comfortable about the subjective validator rotation. But like in like in, my, in like the ghost protocol, we can do subjective. So we sorry, we can do validator rotation without consensus, without doing subjective rotation. But we do make use of the synchronization um, that happens at a certain block for so all future So one thing blocks. with this may thing is that a validator could receive a block from the new validator and just take that information and declare it itself as though it had been you know as though the clients of the new validator had been clients of the old one yeah that's always that's kind of always an issue yeah and so you can just pretend that you know acts as a proxy for the new validator until everybody but agrees but you would just take his fees and not give him any not give him any money obviously why ask, why take why act as a proxy when you can just you know, take steal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, I don't see anything necessarily wrong with that for the time period between well, May and must. Well, so the, the, the issue there is that the... You know, it's a um, cost to there, the new validator nor, normally, getting in. Normally Easy. the consensus protocol has an expectation or can have an expectation of blocks from the validators that are named. But when there's a new validator being inducted and the protocol doesn't know that it needs to expect blocks from them, that can be a bit weird. So, like, normally what I do is, I, or what we do is, we have the current validators that are inducted completely rotate the set of validators to, to, to produce the new ones so that they, they are not in competition with the new set uh, over the inclusion of blocks. Yeah, 
So there's a there's a changing of the guard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so somehow the old, the old validators don't get to decide whether the new validators block is in the consensus or not. Somehow that doesn't seem like it's true. It is, isn't it? Well, I mean, they can they can orphan the block. They can orphan the block that cha that rotated the validators out. Yeah. Yeah, but that but old but not it's after it's finalized. <laughs> not after it's finalized. Um, but it's required to be finalized by the old validators. Yeah, by the old validators. Yeah. So like, you know, they they have that whole time period. To just yeah, but but them. but well, that's true. But they can't revert the blocks that the new validators make. Except for by reverting the block that inducts them. So it's something. So I'm not much closer to understanding where we got to than I was when we asked the question. <laughs> was there a decision made? No. Add a, another question about liveness and like the strategy of when validators produce blocks where. The kind of is it likely to strategy. be one that we can answer? Well, I mean, no. The point is to have questions that we want to answer in the future, right? Well, the point of this one was to work through the questions and come to a decision. Oh, but that was optimistic, right? These are tough problems. Each of these, except for maybe tie breaking. I think tie-breaking could be easier. No, no, that, that was a non-issue. It was just... Okay. It wasn't, it, it wasn't, mentioned, it wasn't, about it, it wasn't mentioned in the talk, and I, I just brought it up. Hey. Okay. Yeah. So, but that one does seem easier yeah. than the yeah, other one. That ones. was easy. <laughs> yeah, choose one plus epsilon in the range of zero to a hundredth, and okay. well, well, do you, they're transcendental. They obey no algebraic equations so they must be must satisfy the subset some property yeah. mm, I don't I don't actually use tie breaking in my specs anymore okay <laughs> Greg stares it, at it turns out it's to just <laughs> <laughs> it, it turns out that like oh um, I can just have like an arbitrary choice or a non-deterministic choice in the event of ties and I can detect safety in the sense of like, oh, we don't get to that tie. Like, it can't be tied in the future. Uh, it's maybe nicer to have tie breaking because then you don't need to think about the, the, the tie case. But the tie case doesn't, it doesn't actually factor into the safety proof at all. I thought that like the determinism of the estimator was like really important for the safety proof. But it doesn't actually strictly need to be deterministic everywhere. It just needs to be deterministic in the areas where it gets stuck on certain values. So you can have non-deterministic areas where it's not stuck, sure. and it doesn't break the safety proof. And so I don't. So you know. Uh, so then you can have. Well, what do you do about the stack problem? You just randomly. Make you just a random, You may randomly make a choice, or you always choose this one. Choose the one of the smallest hash. Make a rule. You know, it doesn't. I would don't choose random. either. It doesn't like at the smallest end of the day. Hash it's, it's, the safety, the proof safety, work. proof doesn't really care that much what you do, but for liveness, it might be a little bit more relevant. But well, not that much more. It sort really affects fairness. Yeah, but fairness is it's like imply, also really hard. It's gonna imply, it's gonna imply a fairness problem. I don't. Uh, but you know, I hear your you. choices. Will but 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 we already have enough constraints. <laughs> I think fairness is a tough one. I think I, I'm not. I'm not. Well, let me no, let no, me let I'm me say it. Let me say it. Different. different. I'm saying whatever choice you make implies a fairness problem. Any choice is fair. No, but the random would be fair, right? Be random random might, it might be fair, yeah. But what if, but what if, but, but what about, but the one that has a lower hash did more work? Shouldn't that be compensated? <laughs> you can miss. Um, another idea for uh, another kind of fairness is like, um, Mm, it's, uh, I don't know if fairness is the right word, but there's there's also this notion that like you might want people to be able to influence the protocol in the direction that they want, as opposed to being uh, indifferent to different outcomes. Then you might want to say, look, actually, like it, if, if it's if it's more than sixty percent, uh, I think it's a little different. So imagine if you had like a imagine if in the binary consensus, if it was more than sixty percent agreed on zero or one, then you got then you had to do that. But if it was in between forty and sixty, 
then you got to choose non-deterministically or like whatever you want. Uh, so it still satisfies all the properties in terms of like non-triviality and like all, pretty much everything, except for now there's like this bigger zone in uh, where like you know you can be. I mean, this is I guess like a bigger bivalent zone. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But uh, but but also that's where like the kind of uh, choice the validator could come in because like oh they can the choose validators as long as I, yeah I would rather have the tie breaking property just yeah I, I hear you I mean I like tie breaking don't get me wrong um. but it ends up creating more conversations than it avoids at the end of the day in the code that I have seen written. There are rarely races, um, so I'm not particularly concerned about the taking longer to run aspect of number of races per block. Um, Yeah, so there are two different kinds of races, right? There's um, there's the one where there's contention for a resource, one send and multiple receives or vice versa, right? One to N or N to one or N to M, I guess. Um, but then there's also um, a race As to, is that true? So, are you, are you, are you trying to distinguish between contingent for resources versus significantly different outcomes? No, it's um, if you've got two continuations and both of them can resolve that turn, uh, and then on one path, one gets the I guess that's really the same kind of race. Oh, yeah. Well, well, it's, the only kind of race you can express is that kind of race, but I thought you were going for a qualitative distinction. No, it, it was like if I have um, X bang Q par X bang R par for. Is that how it went? X bang Q par four Y from X um, Y bang Z R A bang Q or B from A Thing. See. So here, there's there's a two level thing going on. So this can immediately reduce and then get the, the bang on Q, at Q. But this one could also immediately reduce and get the bang on at Q. And depending on which of these the interpreter decided to run first. If it's running to a race, there's no. I, I mean, it, it may just say, well, this one comes first, so I'm going to do it first, and then I do this one next, and it never really races, right? Because it would have to do the reduction, find both of these being sent on at Q, and then race with the for yeah, law from so, so at Q. Right, so if this is deployed separately from that, yeah, then you'll get a real rate. Then, then one validator may see this one before it sees that one, and then there's a, there's a, a consensus decision to make, but it's not that 
any particular validator is deciding which of these happens first, yeah. as would be the case if we just deployed what Q, at Q bang Z and at Q bang Z here. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, it's hard for me to imagine some of the application code like that wrong. Like it would, that would be a sure. really, really strange application. So there's consensus, there's consensus finding among different possibilities, which is decided by the fork choice rule and ghost. And then there's uh, a race within a single term that one validator decides how it's going to happen. And then among all the validators, they achieve consensus through ghost. Um, those, I guess, are conceptually different, but I think this one deep thing is okay. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it, those two different cases doesn't decide on this question. But I'm happy saying we're just doing the one deep. Yay, one passed on. Um, you never want to make early to rotation yield a bunch of different questions. Do we really capture all of them? I don't think so. So you want to list the questions here? Which questions do you remember having been asked? How, how do you how do you take how do you add validators to the to the root shard or like the root namespace or whatever the global the global namespace? Top. Top. How do you add validators to top? Well, it's not that you're adding validators to top, it's that you're adding validators at all, because every validator has to know what every other validator, who every other validator is. Yeah, yeah so that's what I mean. Yeah. I always thought validators rotation was going to take place at top. Yeah, so, so somehow the question, that, that's one question, and then the other question is, okay, how does that happen on particular namespaces, both within them and between them? So oh, like, oh, oh, so. Ah, there could be if you have a changing of the guard, then you also have to have. Sorry, changing the guard. So Vlad, Vlad's idea is that you know it's like there's this one moment where yeah, change them all. Basically, like the, no, you're was, not going to change them all. It's not, there's there's not, it's not most quite of them will yeah. stick around like, but they're forever. But they're considered to be a new validator set. Yeah, and the protocol. You, like, you have this. You have like a block in which you now say this is the new validator set. Yes, that's what I had to say. Okay, so so so, I, I, but once you've done that, then you potentially have to reshuffle all of the assignments to regions. But that doesn't make sense. No, because the validator set has, has the assignment of which validators belong to which regions. Oh, you, so you do the assignment at the same time. Yes. Yeah. So that's, yes. That's, that's, that, but that's that is pretty much what Greg was saying, though. That like there should be some kind of ato atomic operation, maybe. Or yeah, it moves from moves. You have to move simultaneously from like being yeah. on one shard to maybe being unassigned to being one on one shard on one namespace to being on another. Yeah, exactly. Is that because but, they need to keep them on sync? Well, trickle. Mm, well, because the, the you want to keep the validators engaged. You don't want to have them be not working for a while. Yeah. And so after they get moved from one space, they should be assigned to another. Yeah. Right. Wait. Uh, what? No. no. So that doesn't. That doesn't. Fall that doesn't that, that, so, were you around for the? Namespaces talk that we no, he did? Didn't. No. Okay. So the way namespaces work in this thing is you have a bunch of regions. I'm going to do three for this drawing. A, B, and C. Each region has a set of validators. Multiple validators don't participate in more than one region. Okay. Then there's a lattice of... Um, Yes. Oh, this one. So there's a lattice of namespaces built on the basis of those regions. So down here is bottom, up here is top, here's uh, A join B, A join C, and B join C. So given N regions, there are two to the N namespaces. Each namespace has is 
a disjoint set of names, but the validators for the namespace is the union oh, of sure. the. So, but validators like the validator set, the validator set in A, B, or C will change over time. Yes, but um, thinking of them as being in A, B, or C is kind of secondary because they're just the set of validators. And then there is an assignment from validators to regions. Yeah. So the question is like, how does that assignment change? So that assignment changes in the block. In which blocks? We, we, we propose something in the top namespace. Okay. Every validator has to validate that namespace. Okay. And so, and so, and so like, you know, if the top namespace was a serial blockchain, I would understand how, how that works because ever, I mean, so, but, but, you know, even there actually blocks from the different namespaces have to refer to the top block in order to evidence the fact that there are part blocks of the between new namespaces machine. don't refer to each other. Um, so how does a how do you know so when so like how does a new a block from a new validator justify its existence uh, at that particular place in the justify in, its existence? Yeah, so like in, so you produce a block from a new from a new validator here. It's not like somehow that like it's it not clear that's valid unless it's in its justification is the uh, the root the block in the top that induced the new validator set. So what the other validators consider that block to be valid or not, whether they have accepted the block in the top. Yeah, so that's, so that's, so that's, so that's, less, that's less of a strong guarantee than if you put in the justification, where like, no, they would have to look. Have to, because you can just go inspect. Yeah, but no, you can't necessarily do that, because different validators will be ahead and behind, and some of the validators will be behind, right? And they won't know um, at so the same so, time. So then they so, hold on to that block. Well, okay, but how about this? You have, you have, you have uh, the, the, the valid, the, the, some validators making blocks making blocks and make, making a potentially longer chain that ignores the blocks from the new validator set uh, and ignores the induction because none of them, because and, and that's all valid because nowhere in that blockchain is there, or in that like block DAG, is there is the, is the evidence of this change included. Couldn't you do the exact same thing even if you did include in your justification? They would just not look at They would just be invalid, yeah, yeah, but they would, but they would be invalid blocks then. What, uh, you know, not if they orbit Oh well, sure, but, if, if, but I'm assuming that the thing, the, the thing that did the thing that did the switch in the top isn't open. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I don't understand the problem that you just brought up. Can you say so, it again? So, so you're you, you, so somehow it seems like you're not recording in the in the blocks some logic that you're requiring the validators to execute, namely that uh, they've seen this block in the top chain in in the longest fork of the top chain. That allows them to now give weight to a block in the in the in the fork choice created by some other validator. So normally, what you'd have is like every block can have the, its pre-block pointer, or it's like place like verified. You verify the fork choice by looking at the justification. But in this case, if you don't have the pointers to the top in the justifications, then you're not going to be able to justify in the block the new fork choice that was made. Uh, but notice you only have to. Validator rotation. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm, just, I'm only talking about those. It's the only time to do that. So that, that for at least four validated rotation. Yeah. You, know, you don't necessarily need to see so every block. Yeah. Okay, so we're saying that we're introducing an extra kind of justification edge. Which is like the, uh, the, the, the one that points to the block that assigned the validators for that block. Yeah, for that block's fork choice rule. Yeah, yeah. So it's an extra justification edge to validator change box yeah. at the top level. Yeah. Basically to like fully justify the fork choice in the context of the just the uh, validator changes. Okay. Limiting the number of validators. This was something Mike Birch proposed. Um, I'm not convinced that's necessary or desirable. Yeah, that feels well, funky. I, I, mm -hmm. I can see a minimum, but not a max. Well, there's a trade-off. I mean, uh, there's a trade-off. I mean, you know, it's not free to have more validators. You have to either accept more latency or more overhead. 
latency to finality or more overhead. Agreed. So, you know, obviously we want the most validators, but we also want the least overhead and the least latency, and we can't get all the nice things. I thought that way to limit it is to just raise the price. Oh, but that is limiting it. Oh, but that's not an artificial limitation. It's oh, an economic it is. limitation. I mean, it's, it's just because you impose the limit with, the, with the economics doesn't mean it's not a real limit, you know, I mean, hmm. there's like, the, the, the more philosophical question is like, where, what trade-off do you want? Like, how many validator slots are you targeting? Because, you know, the, that will be probably a parameter to this so there, mechanism. There right? are blockchains the, that say, we have this many slots available, mm -hmm. you bid for them. Yeah. That's, uh, the, uh, Let the games begin. Totally. <laughs> and, 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 but that, but that, that is like very explicitly a limit on the number of validators. It says, yeah. like, this is the limit, and this is, this is the number of slots. And then you they auction them off. Uh, you have an auction where you have a variable quantity, um, but still probably there you'll probably be targeting the number of validators. So, like, what do you want the target to be? Oh, you target the, or you target the stake. Well, uh, the, um, maybe, but that is hard to do if you're not willing to pay more necessarily there's like a limit on how much stake you can attract with a given budget yeah we're not saying we can't pay this much yeah 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 I, I, but, saying, you know, but, but, but ideally we, we so we, we attract as much stake as possible for every dollar yeah. Let's say, but you know, also, you know, understanding that there might be trade-offs between attracting participation and penalizing people for liveness failures, for example. So, I mean, that is a good question. Like, how many validator slots do you want? Maybe then, then whether or not there should be a limit. Yeah, can you set that? Each region already has criteria that it can set. That may be just part of the region criteria. What about top? Because that would mean because each region would have different needs and what they wanted to do, and you have different risks. So top, the, the namespaces are derived from the regions. The regions are the only things we actually have control over. Yeah, totally. But you have to, but the top is itself a consensus protocol, right? That runs with the validators that are, have the, have all of them. It runs with everyone. So your question is: Say one region says we've got no limit on validators and your stake is zero. <laughs> that would be yeah. the, that would be the region because that would mean with um, like geo fencing, like you're going to want you're going to have digital orbs that span whatever, but you're also going to want to geo fence stuff in on regions and just whatever people that want to work within that space. Right, but determining the the, the performance um, SLA for a particular region um, is effectively the same question, right? Um, if you have no SLA for a region, then you can add as many validators as you want, but then everybody else bears the burden because it shows up in top. Yeah. Um. Um. But the overhead doesn't need to be increased by the additional validators if you're willing to accept more latency. Or if you uh, sacrifice security. Uh, or mm, what do you mean? Or, or you, migrate your, you migrate your contracts. Don't what? Sorry. You, if you didn't put all of the validators in top. Oh, yeah, you don't have to put all of them in top. Yeah, that would be easier. Yeah, because there there aren't the isolated the region. Aren't uh, all val validators are? Did you say they're stuck in the region they're at? Yeah, validators validate one region. Okay, um, but they also well, validate they the, they validate the, all of the namespaces yeah, containing they, that region. Exactly. Okay, joined with that region. Yeah. So so you're not necessarily. Oh, I just mean for tops finality, you'll, you'll be sacrificing weight. Yeah, yeah, but maybe it's fine. I don't know. Yeah, how many people are gonna deploy a top? I mean, I don't know. Uh, but but um, 
I think that's what I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that, that is actually, that's probably the easier decision to make is to say, okay, well, because we don't want to worry about getting dosed, we just target the super low overhead and just accept really long t- times of finality in the event that someone creates um, namespace with a or adds like a tremendous number of validators to a so or what do they call it regions? Yeah. yeah. But isn't that just going to add more validators? Yeah, that's just adding a new validator set. I mean, adding a new region to assign to. Yeah. So how do we... How do we prevent top getting dosed by people adding validators willingly to... Yeah, by, by accepting arbitrary delays in oh, finality. You, like in proof of work or traditional proof of stake protocols, you can do any number of nodes with the same overhead. Um, but you know the time to finality is much longer because everyone has to make like patiently make their blocks in the same chain, yeah. uh, and the time it takes to get a quorum is a lot longer. So we had thought about charging more in some sense. All right, if you if you run it in A join B, you pay the fee for running it in A and the fee for running it in B. Yeah, exactly. So that limits the, yeah. So if you're adding a validator to some podunk namespace, you have to pay to get that processed in the fastest, most expensive region. But like, how do you decide on the parameterization of A union B or of like A union C? What do you mean? Um, the the consensus protocols in the different regions presumably would be specified by what, whoever created the region. No, or, the consensus protocol is the same all the way around. No, but like, well, I mean, not if you have different needs for latency or different needs for number of validators. There's a there's a different parameterization of the. There'll be different slashing conditions. No, not not even different for, for, for liveness. Yes, but not for safety. So the safety stuff is the same. Yeah. But the hoop makes blocks where is different. If you want to have super low latency, you have to make blocks and like um, you have to make more blocks faster. Um, if you want super low overhead, you make blocks in like a blockchain with like very low orphan rates. That, that and those are different. Well, it change it's a different parameterization of the protocol. It doesn't. It's not changing the protocol. It's just a different parameterization. Well, I mean, at least. No, it's not just validator capacity. It's like the question. The question is like, for example, do you do you make a blockchain? Do you do rounds? You know, if you do rounds, you can fin- fin- finalize much faster, but there's more overhead. If you do, if you make a blockchain, finality will take a while. If you do something in between, where you're doing like a blockchain with like four votes for every height, or four messages for every height, then you can you know finalize four times faster than uh, blockchain does. But the overhead is also higher. There, there is like, if if you want different regions to run different parameterizations in terms of latency, for example, or overhead, then you're also going to need to decide what parameterization to use for the joints. Yeah, I think for virtually, they're all going to be the same everywhere. It's uniform. Yeah. So that, so that, but that's great. I mean, I, I like that. And uh, but then, why not also just put the make the validators uniform? Okay, where the validator is running the same protocol, but like all in the co-located or something. Yeah. Okay, but okay, fine. Uh, the super the super yeah, nodes we're, approach. We're assuming that we're going to have to have um, a couple of racks, twenty machines connected by forty gigabit fiber between them, and for every least, single validator. No. no. Okay. But but in order to get. Forty thousand transactions a second. Um, On a these single... are the kinds of deployments that are going to have to. Well, not if you have like concurrency, right? Even... So it's this good. it depends on what you mean by transaction. If all you mean is forty thousand com events, then you could do that on one machine and put all forty thousand of them in one block and just spit it out. Yeah. But that's not what people hear when Greg says forty thousand transactions a second. They think. 
that means one transaction is going to take a 40,000th of a second. I'll be able to get this blindingly fast, which isn't even what Visa provides, right? Theirs take a few seconds, but in any given second, there are 40,000 of them happening concurrently. And these are balance transfer transactions, not just com events. So in order to do 40,000 balance transfers per second, a balance transfer, say it takes 100 bytes to specify exactly what balance gets transferred. Um, even if you divide that up among the nodes, you're still going to have to be pumping a lot of bandwidth through these these connections, you're going to need a serious deployment in at least part of the network to achieve those sorts of those sorts of rates. But hopefully, like every namespace is only responsible for a small part of it, and no one needs to have a supercomputer or like a super. I mean, somehow, like having high barriers to entry is like always bad. Well, we can try some numbers here. Right? So, say we've got um, some total number of nodes, some interconnectedness proportion. So, NC is the number of nodes that any particular one is connected to in the, in the network. Then we'll have, um, say, 100 bytes per transaction. And um, we're looking at, uh, say we've got 100 megabit per second connection. So what is the limit of the number of transactions this thing can do? We've got this guy connected to NC others. Um, 100 megabits per second to distribute among them. So you have to divide that by NC. And then we want it to go both ways because they're all interchanging. So we divide it by two here. Let's say 100 megabits per second is 10 megabytes per second, just to make it easier. Um, got 100 bytes per transaction. That is um, 10 to the 6th divided by 10 squared is 10 to the 4th over 2NC transactions per second. So this back of the envelope thing is probably off by at least one order of magnitude, if not two, um, because it always is. Um, and C you know, if you're connected to 20 other nodes or 1,000 other nodes, that's going to drop this significantly. If you've got 65,000 ports, you probably want to use all of them to connect to these other things. 65,000 is bigger than 10 to the fourth. You're getting one transaction per second out of, out of this. So 10 megabits per, per second is way too small. So it's the back of the end. Why do we have so many connections? If you have if you have a million validators, mm -hmm. then you're not going to connect each node to all million of the of other ones, not. but you you'll want to do so, you know tens of thousands of other ones. No way! Like we have like twenty. We use twenty five in Ethereum right now. Like you know. But maybe, how many validators maybe, have you got? We've got thousands of validators. Oh no, uh, thousands of full nodes. Yeah. Or if we don't have validators, we have miners. Miners are hard to count because they don't sign up in the same way. Right. We don't know how many miners there are, really. No, I don't think the validators but are there's that. many. That's kind of the minimum and the max. You've got to have You've got to have both. But anyway, it's it's clear that we yeah. need something yeah. bigger than megabytes per second. We're going to need gigabytes per second. Unclear. Totally unclear to me. For every, every node? Oh, I think no, crazy. no, just for a significant component in order to no, reach I mean, this. I doubt it. Speed. Like you know, we, we we with gossip layers and like you know, like you don't do all. I encourage you to take this up with Nash. He knows a hell of a lot more about it than I do. Oh man, so. I mean, you should. Uh, there's there's the Bitcoiners have done like you know, a lot of work 
and making sure that like you only need a little trickle of data to make like you know the m m m blocks available um, because like you know not I mean not everyone is going to upload every blo every block to all of their peers I mean so you only need to do from for a tiny fraction of them because other people probabilistically also have that block I mean you do like think about efficiency and gossip networks. I don't understand how you get around this number. Oh, because like every node needs to uh, needs to download the blocks, let's say, okay. uh, for the particular namespaces that they're assigned to. Okay. That's all the bandwidth that they need to download, and there needs to be an upload of uh, like exactly matching that amount to them. And 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 unless you're doing this many blocks per second, then there's like no reason to require that much upload capacity. You know, definitely not like an order, like you know, no, definitely not many orders of magnitude more upload capacity is required than download capacity. So you're saying the, no, the, the validator doesn't have to broadcast to all the other validators. Not a, not every single Sorry, thing, sound, of course not, Sorry, because 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 each one of them, because like you well, know, even without I, broadcasting you, to all the other validators, you want to broadcast to all your neighbors. No, you broadcast to like a random like tenth of them. And then you, uh, and, and like, because, but, like, but then, but they're then, all doing this, right? Then you have a much stronger likelihood of equivocation. Because well, I mean, you, you basically have to, uh, like, understand the overhead of your gossip protocol versus the reliability that it provides. Uh, and, you know, and, and you have to be able to tune it so that it's, like, more efficient also because you don't want to cause huge barriers to entry, uh, especially when it's not necessary. Well, I'm trying to figure out the necessity. Yeah, so I mean basically the, 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 the basic thing to think about is the amount of bandwidth that needs to be provided by the gossip network. Like, so in, and, and you can think about it in terms of the, the amount of data that any node needs to download. Okay. And, uh, you know, like, have you guys thought about a block size limit? Like, I mean, I guess you're big blockers. You don't want one megabytes every ten minutes, obviously. How many? What's the block size? Well, I mean, the whole the whole point here is to try to minimize bandwidth compression. Sure, no, no, no but but um, you know that aside, uh, I mean, so of course, but like we're talking about bandwidth capacity here, like presumably post compression. You know, but he just he just took, took a target, right? He took a target on block size. Well, so about hundred megabytes a second. I mean, that, that 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 I don't think that was the down that the amount that you expect someone to need to download. He's assuming that, uh, that you're broadcasting to a large number of peers That's on correct. all the blocks, which is not the way that these gossip networks work today, right? You you probabilistically broadcast to some peers, and those are only for new blocks. For older blocks, you wait for requests, okay. and you know, you, and 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 you don't somehow like not everyone. We don't have the requests be served redundantly. You know, uh, if at all possible. Okay, so your 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 argument is that you get some kind of probabilistic cover. Oh yeah, I've never I've never heard of I've never heard of any gossip scatter network that one hundred percent one hundred percent broadcasts yeah, every right, message every day. Yeah, because then you're yeah. using statistically. Yeah, it still gives you pretty good integrity, right? You're going to lose some percentage, which is going to lower your but you're, you're balancing, like always, you're balancing performance and functionality. Yeah, but it seems like you need some kind of technical coverage. Yeah, I mean, and I mean, there's all sorts of people who work on gossip protocols. Yeah, it'd be like a statistical algorithm. Like mm -hmm. be, I'm sure they have percentages. Yeah, I'm mm -hmm. sure the gossip, I mean, there's, there's, there's people who work on this stuff. Yeah. And, um, so but, but basically, the, 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 the gossip. But that's know, the same problem with having a node that every other node, know, like a fully mesh. Yeah, well, no, yeah, you can't do it. It's not scalable at all. Well, fully mesh, peer to peer, just can't do it. Yeah, it's just too complicated. Yeah, they have to send a message to the entire network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. But very non.
Wait, did you say that it's every node, every it sends a message to the entire network? The specification is that the consensus protocol needs a way to send a message to the network. But just by, by, by the by network, propagation. by to every single other node? I no, mean, it, we go by a propagation, right? Oh. So send, here's a message, send it to your peers, and gotcha. then so on and just so forth. Yeah, until it. And we're using Kademlia right now. I don't know that we'll continue to, but there's no reason. I mean, nobody's told me that we should do something besides Kademlia. No, he's still there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Vlad is of the opinion that um, we don't need on the order of gigabits if we use a gossip network to get this stuff transmitted around that back the envelope calculation we did. Well, it depends on how many blocks. It's missing you something. Like, for a second of blocks for every node to arrive. If you had every node to like download a gigabit, it would fall along the order of a gigabit per second of blocks. I was wondering, could you all possibly sit in the front so that we can like, see the discussion? Uh oh. Make a little more sense for this. <laughs> yeah, Nash is used to it. Huh? Um, <laughs> let me. Good luck, go ahead and. Uh, I'm no. trying to context switch the graph that they need to fit in. in. Yeah, I just wrote it up there and then yeah, I raised it again. But <laughs> oh, <it's fine>. really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, th I think what I would say is that, like, if, if all you ever had to transmit was just the um, blocks and transactions, then that would be fairly low bandwidth. But that's not true. Right? You actually have, like, for realistic applications, there's a lot of data, and you do have to transmit all the data. Right, you have to transmit it to all the nodes that are validators. Right, so if you have a hundred, if you have a hundred validators, right, and you're in an environment where you're getting forty thousand transactions a second, and each transaction is a megabyte, it's a lot of data. Well, I mean, so right. they, sure, but you know, if you're in an environment where you're getting less data, fine, but but we want to build a network that supports a lot of data. Right? So, but, but you can do that by like not without having every, any validator support a lot of data. You can so, do it with, like, you know, with this whole oh. so starting thing, right? The he's, partici thing. he's partitioning the communication into um, da downloading the blockchain versus a gossip. So he's got two phases of communication, essentially. And then the gossip doesn't fan at all. It doesn't go every... It's not, you know... It's a choice between, like, if you want a, um, a situation where you don't have very many outbound connections, yeah, yeah. then you get a lot of hops until you cross the network. Yeah. If you want to, and that increases latency. Yeah. So yeah. this, so the width... But reduces like the their load on every node. Because most nodes aren't connected to each other. Right? If you want it, if you want to get latencies on the order of, like, less than a second mm -hmm. per per transaction, then you have to have a graph that's nearly interconnected amongst yeah. the values. But then you're talking right? about a tremendous like a tremendous amount of overhead and uh, like, like for some name, for some regions, right? It's not fixed for, for all regions. How do you there how do you some regions where you're like you have lots of nodes and the interconnectedness of the graph is low. And so the transactions in that region will be slow, there will be low bandwidth, right? But there will be lots of safety. Yeah, right. Understood. There will be other regions where it's like, look, we, we picked one data center near May East, we put 10 racks in there, and they all have 100 gig switches at the top, 100 gig interlinks between them. People buy machines in those racks, and they can validate at ridiculous bandwidths across each other. And right? what about the join of those two regions? The join of those two regions is the join of those two regions, right? Like, it has characteristics of both. But, how, but I mean, that seems weird. It's weird. The internet is weird. This is 2018. What do you want? Well, I want to know. I want to know how many. I want to know. Keep the internet I, I wanna, weird. No, I, I, I want to know if I if I if I'm going to need to download large amounts of data, or if my variable energy will be increased by the existence of a region which I now join with, who that is in this like crazy data data center. Well, the data that's in that region, right, isn't in the things that you have to validate it unless you're there. No, I'm right? in the join with that, with that region. You don't have no because the namespaces are disjoint. Right, so the data is in the region, not in the join with that region. Sure, but there's going to be something in the join, right? Things that are in the join are the things that you care about. Mm -hmm. And right? how and and how is that bounded? 
it's bounded by the cost function, meaning the sum across the regions that are joining. Right? So the hot, the more you join, the, the more expensive it gets. I understand that. Because you have to but, pay lots but, of But shouldn't a, no, shouldn't a validator be able to say, well, this is the most bandwidth capacity that I will need to operate in this region? Um, no, the other way around. They, sh they should know that they sure. need you see, Well, you want much. both. You want, you want, you need both. You need to have, like, you need to know both, really. But what, what you're arguing what? is for resource planning? Yeah, they, absolutely. They want, they want a top. You want both. You absolutely want to know that I won't need to upgrade to this megabit connect, or like gigabit connection that requires that I build my value. No, no, it's, it's to that's totally backwards, right? You want to know what you have to have at minimum to be successful there. Right, and then you would like to be able to afford to continuously upgrade. Ah, uh, yeah, right? so you got so, an overhead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, the, so, um, you know, if you're in a high performance region, what you want to know is what's the least that I have to contribute, and how how much do I have to do to be good in this region, right? Um, you would, you're going to want to do more, and if you're making a lot of money in that region, you're going to want to upgrade. Right? And all your partners will too, because the way you make money is by growing. Yeah. Right? So the more transactions join your region, the better off you are, the more you deploy. Sure. But you also want to know an upper bound so that you don't get dust. Right? You have you, you don't want to like suddenly be facing uh onslaught of requests that you can't fill because of the bandwidth like you know, unrealistic bandwidth requirements. So, but I agree that you want to minimum. You get paid for each transaction. Yeah, but you might be resource constrained. Okay. I mean, if I'm resource constrained, I'm in the wrong region. Right, but you, but like ideally, you'd have low barriers to entry and as many people be able to being able to contribute as possible. In some regions, that's that's true. Okay, but what about What's the joints? Point? I'm so confused about the joints and. The joints is like the source of properties. Of it seems yeah, like, yeah, like so, like yeah. there are slow regions and there are fast regions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then there are like large regions, like big data regions, right? There's a lot of data, see there's a lot of data in here, okay? And you want to join between some fast region and this big data region. Don't have to transfer all the data in here. No, of course not. To transact with it. No, but the, the question is, how much will the transactions that go on in the join increase the amount of bandwidth that's required for some region? Let's let's, let's add another region called the low bandwidth region. Yeah, slow. Slow. Okay, great. The low, low, bandwidth. low, low bandwidth. So, so now that one is going to join with the big one, and with all the other ones, right? How much? So, like, so can you bound above the amount of bandwidth that is required to be in low? <coughs> the characteristics of this. So this is this thing up here, right? It's not a large data region just because it's joining. No, but it might be. Right? No, it's not, right? Because the only transactions that are here are things where, like, this guy is transferring money to this guy, or this guy is transferring money to this guy. Or, or right? messages, right? Sending messages, right. But mm -hmm. you can't send a lot of messages to a low bandwidth region. Or they'll so take a long it's time. Just the way that it is. Or they'll take a long time, or, you know, or maybe it won't be even valid to have that much messages in the blocks. I don't know how you would, I mean, that that's, how do you well, I mean, force that, right? And now you're adding extra stuff to the protocol. Well, I mean, it's a block limit, block size limit. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not that block boring. Size limit. Yeah. As much as you want. So then all of the, so, so basically my main, my main concern is like, oh, with like the super nose thing is that you will drive up the minimum and that the, um, to participate in the network at all, you're going to have to have. Uh, a, a, a reasonable size investment. I, I'm not so seeing that. It doesn't force. It doesn't yeah. force low to do anything. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Well, so what's the what's the argument that I still don't know what happened. What what is like like what is the overhead of transacting of of, of processing all the all the joints? So the overhead for low mm -hmm. is it's going to take a long time to process messages, but they signed up for that, right? They said. We're low bandwidth, so yeah. they're low bandwidth, so they deal with the consequences of being low bandwidth. Yeah, but if they are to participate in the, in the namespaces of other regions, then they'll have high bandwidth. Then any any joined it. namespace is going to have the worst characteristics of the, of the regions that are being right. joined. So what will happen is contracts that really need 
big data will migrate to the big region and contracts that really need fast will migrate to the fast regions yes, but, but and contracts that want to be cheapo they'll migrate to the low region everything <laughs> migrates to the bottom yeah right? because <laughs> costs go up exponentially the higher up you go yeah right so you go to the least that, like no one will ever publish a transaction at the top level because it's insanely expensive. Except the only people that will do that are people who are like, I want to stake the network. Exactly. Right? Those essentially only the trans only transactions at the top are bonding and unbonding and slashing transactions. Right? So your your contract is gonna to want to float down to the lowest level where it will run and perform the way you want. And then it will only go up higher when you have to transact across to another region. Right? But in general, what Mike and Kyle have done is come up with a way to guarantee that that's minimized, right? That you always, your contract can always get pushed down to the lowest level where its names can all be resolved, right? So that's the goal. And then we have um, what I can just call poly, a polycentric network where some regions are fast and expensive and some regions are safe and slow. And there's a, there's a, there's a trade-off, right? And this this is I said this in the other room, so I'll say it here too. Um, this is a physical requirement, right? If you want things to be fast, they have to be close together. And if they're close together, then they can be taken out with one bond, right? That's centralization. And that's if you want things to be safe, they have to be far apart, and that makes them slow, right? So that's just physics of light. <laughs> yeah, but you're not even talking about. But you're not even talking about that much latency. Like, like knowing each other's IP address makes a bigger difference than the distance between the nodes. Like, if you have nodes across the globe, but they know each other's IP address, like versus like having to do four or six hops, you know. No. Like the reason why distributed systems are really slow today, like on the blockchain, is because of the many hops, not because of the yes, this, many hops. not because of the speed of light across the globe. It's like the thirty. Well, it's because the graph is not well connected. Right. So, so that's what I'm saying. So that's like a bigger thing for latency in practice than the physical space between the nodes. Right. And for our chain regions, they should be well, reasonably well connected when they can. But that, but that creates right. vulnerability, right? Also, because now everyone knows everyone's IP addresses. There's, it's like easier to find out where everyone is, right? One of but you want to know where everyone is so that you can send the messages right away. Well, it depends on the trade-offs you're making, right? If you if you want like to be like more decentralized, then you Go don't. To a different region. Right. Uh, so, so but the concern the concern, that the concern is that decentralized have lots of cable modems on. Right? So obviously, <laughs> there will be some regions where everything is on the, sitting underneath a hundred gig switch. But right? but the question is, why does the security of one not undermine the security of the rest of the system? The insecurity of one. So let's 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 make a region called low security region. That like basically just it's not security. It's like um, it's trite, right? No, but I'm just so, saying like oh look, we, let's make a region that's particularly easy to attack and to cause failure. Okay, that's one thousand, right? It's For, just the flat. Is that is that allowed? Two. Let's say why not? You allow flat that? Later? Okay. Well no, then I'm gonna no, make no, it valid. I've been arguing. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna accept. Number validated I'm gonna, for a while. People are gonna. You are arguing for a small. I'm arguing. For, I'm not not maximum number of validators. I've been arguing for minimum number of validators because I worry that cartels come and pick off fringes. Absolutely. Uh, well, I mean, but the, the the concern is like, could I make an invalid block that spends someone else's currency? No, because uh, the rest of the network will see it. Uh, but they won't. But they're not going to validate all the transitions on my chart. So how will they know? On the my name space, how will they know? Well, in your region, you well, there are. I have them. users, and that, those, those are the people I'm robbing. Look, but in your region, you can cheat all you want up until the point where you come try to spend it in my town. But how and will you catch you? <laughs> with a slash. You're not going to be able. You're not going to be able to catch me unless you validate my, what happened on my on my name space. Right. That's the point. Is that yeah. you're in your own little bubble, robbing and cheating and stealing. But but, but, and but then, you can't force everyone <laughs> to validate other people's names. Now you're telling me that in order to process the join. I need to actually validate all of the transitions on all the things that are being joined. No, only only the things that matter, right? So if there's if you're trying to spend some resource, well, everything that's causally before. So you do full validation of no, all the no, all the causal on, only history, up to, only up to the the last finalized block. So we go okay. last finalized block, and and you're trying to spend one resource over in some other region. At that point, 
Now, okay, what, now is, what is this notion of finalized? Where is this finalized? How is it finalized? Is it on the, on the, on the namespace? Or is it a more global notion? And how do you know that you haven't, what if you finalize something invalid? Again, the point is you only detect, you only care about that at the time that you go to the next town. But the that next region. forces you to validate the history of this little security zone. Or the super big, the big zone that it was going really fast and you can't keep up with. But the point is that it, it's undermining the security of the whole system, not just the security of that zone. But how would it, it couldn't transfer because they wouldn't accept. And the, the only reason they can, so but, but no, they wouldn't accept example it. They, 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 they would say it. There's one low security zone where a cartel has multiplied all of their graph balances by 10. Yeah. And then they try to go spend it. They go to a joint namespace. There are no other transactions in that namespace before they try and go spend it. So you move the rev from wherever it was here up to there. How do you verify that that balance there hadn't been altered? He's saying maybe you have to go back and look at all the transactions in this low security namespace to make sure that the balances are correct once they get moved He's to the joint for all, namespace. For all you know, that rev could have gotten there from other namespaces. Yeah, maybe that is a cost when it does try to move, and you do have to. Yeah, they but that's pay. crazy because now you have every region potentially revalidating every region. Uh, only if you have connection, right? It's only when there's the need for, for yeah, but an, exchange. A Byzantine, but a Byzantine shard, with, a Byzantine like like if there's a failure, it's obviously going to be. I mean, it's it's a, it's a it's a natural thing to try to escalate the. You know, I mean, yeah. This, so this, this happens, argues the namespace is going to fail. This argues for a few regions with lots of validators in the region to reduce the possibility of um, coming to consensus in you know, a cartel. Right. Or, the consensus. or you just don't allow rev to be everywhere and just be like, okay, well, you don't get to have this ability to spend rev because you're not, you don't have enough validators to make sure that the blocks are valid. So if you want to have like a zone. I don't think we should have a region at all if we don't have enough validators to make sure the blocks are valid. Well, I mean, I agree, but we were just talking about the validator with, with, with one node in it. No, I mean, I've Greg been... Greg was objecting strongly. Yeah. yeah, but Nash was, you know, I mean, he seemed pretty... No, he was trying to create, he was trying to create, uh, follow your line of reasoning to create a counterexample. Yeah, where basically like, so, so like my concern is that the regions will undermine the security of the other regions by, you know, by basically, by being easier to target because you're allowing... Basically, this like anyone goes anywhere thing, where basically like I can target the weakest region uh, because like I can just straight up sign up to be there. Yeah, I've been arguing that that for Mercury we have a uh, an assignment rather than any validator can sign up to a particular region. Yeah, that sounds way safer. Um, but but the assignment but the assignment is based so it's a the, the trade. No, no. The trade-off that I was thinking about is you have some kind of region-based SLA, and you can only be assigned to a region if you have some evidence that you can meet the SLA, right? So it's it's not yeah. completely random yeah. assignment, yeah. but it's not, you know, uh, the, the flip side is you don't necessarily know what you're going to get assigned to. But you and you can even do that with a single with a homogeneous validator set. You can have different parameterizations of the consensus protocol that that. Each that could be run by anyone with the minimum capacity, um, and so have like a single validator set, but different protocols being offered in different regions, but still, but and, and sample like randomly. But the, the basically the more you fraction, the more you the more you make the validator set a heterogeneous pool, the more it's possible to to as an adversary choose which part of the pool your nodes will be. Your nodes will be in. I mean, I'm assuming that like you were talking about like hardware and bandwidth. And I'm, I think that there has to be some significant heterogeneity, heterogeneity, right? Eventually, and, you know. And I, mean, I think that version four just, point oh, you know. No, no. I, I think we have to be able to support heterogeneity. Yeah, like in version four point oh. <laughs> but I think that that 
um, uh, like somehow you need to have how a, that heterogeneity is supported is available to us. We have some choices now. Yeah, uh, I hear you, but um, it's not going to be free. I mean, there's trade offs. Yeah. It's always a double edged sword, right? Mm -hmm. And you don't even know at this point how much liquidity you have for validators. Like, you don't know actually whether you have val and then, like, how much hardware of what qualities. For the validators? Yeah. But that's the metric co collect connection. Like, for me, that's why you were going to set that up and do not just stuff they can send, right? But do checking between the different nodes to see what performance, right? Do load testing to see what their threshold of limitations are. Because then you can fit them in. Sure. Sure. And, 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 and there'll be different. To me, there's different types of nodes. Like, I, but, but, yeah, but, but and, and, you want, and you want to test them to make sure that they're actually actually have the resources that they yeah, send. To fit. But that's you know, also complicated, and then a whole other protocol. Oh, for the metrics? No, for yeah, for for, for verifying that they have the I capacity. Mean, it's not that. They I mean, I hear you, but it's not. It's not like a. It's not free. It's not, not free. Like, also, also not free. Yeah. It's kind of a simple, also, easy versus simple, right? Simple <laughs> is hard, but mm, <laughs> it depends. Yeah, it, it, you know, <clears throat> simple and non-trivial is hard. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think I think that's the. Um, you know, I hear you, but uh, it it, seem, it just seem, it seems it just seems a little ambitious. That's all. Nothing else in this. Is. <laughs> no, there's lots of things that seem a little ambitious. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, but one, you know, I mean, I'm all I'm, I'm I'm into more and more complicated protocols, but I like to see some amount of iteration from something that's like more, I mean, less likely to fail. I don't know. I, I guess I'm more, I guess more, I get more concerned when there's compromise on security than anything else. Oh, which, yeah, you don't want to undermine that. But I was always thinking that there could be different areas where, again, you have low security, people know that low cost to get in, so they're risking, right? They're gambling in a way. Versus high cost, yeah. high overhead. As long as, you know, it doesn't it force doesn't it. It doesn't impact the other. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You want to isolate it. Yeah, you want to, exactly. Yeah. You want to isolate it. You wouldn't let them come naturally. Yeah, it's like one way, one kind of more standard way to do this is to have like a hierarchical model where um, of, of like kind of like side chain like zones that keeps track of each other's balances. And so if there's an invalid block, the worst that could happen is the total balance of that shard would be stolen as opposed to uh, having an unbounded potential consequence of an invalid state. Yeah, well, it leaks in, but only up to the balance of that, the yeah, total yeah, balance yeah, of yeah, that. Yeah, 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 really, like, mitigating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I think, I, I would think we could do that. Like, yeah, but it, really, it is going to impose some restrictions on how funds have to flow between shards, because now they have to go so, through this hierarchy so that the accounting can work out. Yeah, but that would only be one of the I mean, but if you allow everyone to do anything, then... Yeah, yeah. probably. No, you have to. Well, I mean, uh, or you just accept that like the level of fault tolerance is really low. I don't know. Yeah. So, what's the time? I don't know. Discovery. What I'm trying to tease out the nose. No hey, Matt, what time do we start? We're supposed to be back at four. Okay. So we got uh, 25 minutes to yeah. kind of wrap. A couple, couple other questions that we had, and I had a question too, when there's talk about um, the connectivity between nodes and trying to tease out peer to peer discovery, which yeah. is code, which has to be uniform, versus physical connectivity, which is what Nash is talking about in the rap. Right? In my mind, I mean, arguably, you could discover more peers locally, but it was still going to the same protocol. Yeah, I'm not sure how that would result. No, 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 no. The, the difference is if, if there, there's lots of bandwidth between them, then um, they become, even, even though they are discovering each other, they can still pump data across each other. Yeah, that I understand. Wait, what it, was, it, was, it was kind of communicated that they would be more connected, like it would be, it'd be a tighter web, right, versus the Kademlia network, the Kademlia protocol will just 
discover nodes at a certain rate, and it'll cap out at like 50 nodes or something, 50 peers, something to that effect, right? Right. So it creates a web of a certain density, but the impression I got is that in some namespaces, the web itself would be more dense versus the pipe speed thicker. And you can set that, right? Well, so, so basically the way that I understand it is in, is in terms of what nodes know whose IP addresses and what protocol they use to route between them. So in like a Cadelia thing, you only know the IP addresses of some relatively small number of nodes. Right. In the fully connected thing, you know everyone's IP address. And so you can establish like a TCP connection, you know, or like, like... Yeah, I mean, we're not building a fully connected network. It's just really simple. So I'm yeah. just curious as to how one name basically fully connected, otherwise you can definitely understand. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I also, I also don't know. They're all using Cadimlia, but but the the question is what what's the connectivity that the Cadimlia is running on top of? Maybe, or maybe you do have a protocol so, where if you know their IP, you don't use Cadimlia, and if you don't, then you use Cadimlia. Yeah, you can choose whatever. To me, it was choose whatever. Fall back. Protocol. Yeah, you fall you fall back to Cadimlia when you don't know. Taking that IP out of the picture for no identity. No, you okay. don't want to use it. Because I would think there's sometimes you want it because you'll have less latency, and sometimes you don't want it when you want the uh, anonymizing or whatever. And yeah. Something like a door. Yeah, but that yeah, you get security compromise if you start. Yeah, which is that trade-off versus performance versus security. But maybe people are like, it, it's not worth it. Paul and I are laughing because he's directing. <laughs> like right now, <laughs> probably right now. Yeah. Um, so isn't isn't the number of connections in Kademlia just a parameter? Can you set it to a thousand if you want? Yeah, you can set it to whatever you want. Is that like random? Right? In Kademlia, isn't the number of connections you maintain to neighbors a parameter? You can just set it to a thousand or something? Um, I don't know. Not right now. It is now an implementation. I don't know if it's it's. Constrain the algorithm, but we don't have that. There's no parameter for the max number of peers or anything like that? No. No, I mean, I know when Chris built it, he capped out at 50. No, Chris, he did, no, he did, did he set it? Oh, did he, he told me he capped it out at okay, 50. Yeah. So he right now it it's not. Okay, but we have, we have redone a lot of the code that Chris did. We are in the process of doing that. Yeah. Yes. And, and if we want to parameterize that, we can, and then tweak later on. And that's perfectly reasonable. Probably this. Because that would be a region. Wouldn't that be part of the SLA? Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because that was always me what it was. And like I said, there's always that trade-off. More, more nodes, more overhead, but more security more like that, less. Okay. If you wanted to know all of the IP addresses, it didn't really cost it out. Mm -hmm. Do we decide no? We don't want any like fully matched for the way no IP addresses of everything. The node identity does not include the node IP address. Okay. It's just the node. Is that with reputation at all? Because that was something I was concerned with with reputation. But you have to be able to know the IP address to communicate with it at some point. Well, only if you want to do it like directly. Yeah. Without going through two, three, seven months. Yeah, you need to know the IP address to connect to it. But the IP address will not be used to identify. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's fine. Yeah. So, it was, so then there needs to be like a discovery process, right? Uh, that's like region specific, so that like you can advertise that oh, I'm on this region, and if you're also in this region, then I'll give you my IP address. Um, you know, so you can somehow like prove that you're assigned to that region because of the identifier uh, and the public key associated with it, and therefore only so reveal your IP address. So we can have a contract that keeps the current IP address for. A, but then you, but then you do leak that information for everyone. Whereas, like in the protocol that I'm suggesting, is a little more distributed. And you know, we're just, we're just going to be implementing TLS. So each certificate is going to operate both like I mean, each server is going to operate both like a client and a server. They're going to SSL handshake, yes, TLS handshake, exchange, exchange secret, secret, exchange certificates, and now you have a trusted peer. Identity, How concerned are we for Mercury no, IP. for yeah. governments going around and learning the IP addresses of validators and taking them out? And how did you respond? <sighs> we have two questions to get to. Synchronicity constraint to prevent censorship attacks. So where the validators just ignore the message. This was in Michael Birch's presentation. The synchrony constraint. That window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The synchrony yeah. constraint. Yeah. 
And then, I, I didn't, you know, that's these where... Synchronicity constraint. Yeah. As soon can I expect my scarab? It's <laughs> about it, it's about it, it's So we talked about a few things. Adding a portion of the piece to on, help, hold on it for 10 days. So the synchrony constraint, I guess he means like censorship rejection via synchrony assumption? Yes, that's... Like that's you make that's, an assumption about when messages get through, yeah. and, there, and if the message doesn't get in the chain, and I assume it's being censored if it's paying enough fees or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was his idea, yeah. yeah. Vitalik wrote a paper about it. <laughs> he should uh, take a look. It's pretty good sure. one. Sure, what's Here's the paper's name? Censorship yeah. rejection. Censor, censorship, censorship rejection. Rejection? Yeah, he's called censorship rejection. Through suspicion scores. Through suspicion scores. <laughs> 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 Any other transactions? So there was a point. Right, that was. The C, yep. Validator escaped and the validator could just walk. Oh, oh uh, when, when the fees exceed their. Their stake plus loss. some ROI. Right. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What, so, but so, uh, but that, that's actually. Uh, I mean, it, it's. It, it's it's not entirely true because you still lose money from walking. It's just that you're in the green and that it was worth it yeah. from the point of view of like, but that doesn't mean that like you didn't, like it's still a cost. Well, you're still like, right. you're so still, you're, if you just care about your incredible payouts, like you still want to stay. So that's what I'm saying. I, I think that there should be some r ratio of, um, it's a set of relationships, which is the, the, cost of the initial stake, the percentage of that stake that any one transaction fee covers, and the rate that you're accumulating transaction fees. Um, so they have to remain in the network for some amount of time, guaranteed, right, to be before they even break even. So, I mean, you know, I, I hear you. I mean, I think... It, but the main reason why I would do that is because it would give me a stronger ability to penalize them because you can withhold yeah. based on their Byzantine behavior the fees forever. Yeah. Um, Nash would like, if possible, to be able to prevent coalitions, but if not, then at least when somebody comes in to take over, um, they make everybody who's already there rich. Okay. Um, <laughs> right. You can just buy all of them out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think that like is fundamentally like that doable because like existing members can form the coalition. Sure, I'm, I'm talking about um, takeover from someone with a lot of money and resources. Yeah, but it could be people who are already in the network. It doesn't need to be external takeover. And there's already going to be a parallel distribution of stake bonded, right? Mm -hmm. Usually, where you're more, the sure, cartel I'm model. talking about when there is the situation of somebody coming in and trying to take over. Yeah. Then it should be. either need to bribe everyone, or by buying their way in, they pay everyone um, enough that they have essentially done the same thing. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, that is the dream. But the, but the, somehow the way that I think about that is also uh, in terms of maximizing the cost of attack. Because if you maximize the cost of attack, you maximize the amount of coins that they need to purchase in order to conduct the attack, and that is like the maximum amount of fund transfer from them to the coin holders. And the coins are fundamentally the resource that's required to attack these things. Yeah. So, you know, max, I think maximizing the cost of attack entails, as much as possible, maximizing the transfer of funds from the attacker to the coin holders. At least if we're talking about maximizing the in-protocol cost of attack. With mining, it's a little more complicated. So, the meta, with respect to the question that you had on the table, the issue is that um, 
if you don't pay out the transaction fees, then the validator is steadily losing money, right? They may not be able to stay in the game because they have to pay for the equipment that they're... So you have so there's a trade-off, which is you have to pay them out, but you want to pay it out, you know, at some rate relative to the stake that they put in. So you can you have some guarantee. But it, they can also like borrow at the market rate against their future rewards, right? Like someone can loan them money. There's an expectation of future rewards that can take a loan. Sure. Like collateralize into their future transaction fees. So, like, I'm not sure that you actually need to be paying out the whole time. Well, but you can't borrow against Bitcoin right now from a bank. You know, the, you can prove sure, ownership. Sure, I guess uh, the point would be, like, you know, maybe, there, maybe you reveal your identity to someone. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's a little expensive. There's cost, some cost of borrowing, and it's not that low if you want to borrow um, to finance your like mining operation or something. I'm sure you, if you have the, it's a barrier to entry to have to get this financing, and the financing isn't going to be free. But one idea is like, okay, well, if we know the minimum capacity that a node requires, and we know how much that costs, and just multiply that cost by two, and provide them that much in fees. And and then everything above that you 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 would hold. That way you can say, oh look, we've reduced the barrier to entry by giving everyone financing of their costs on an ongoing basis once they're bonded, uh, but no more. Um, but then you have to have some kind of estimate about their costs and decide something about the fee payment mechanism as a function of that estimate. Yeah. Which you know, I mean, is the worst thing. That's not a bad answer. Heard. That's that's a perfectly acceptable answer as first iteration. Mm -hmm. I think I think better is just to pay them the fees right away to not think about it because it's all it's already I think a bit complicated for a first iteration because uh, it's only a marginal improvement on security. It's like not a significant improvement. It's definitely not an order of magnitude improvement. It's like a small improvement, basically because the fees are an order like two orders of magnitude, one to two orders of magnitude less than the deposit, anyways. And so, um, are relatively insignificant compared to the disincentive of losing the deposit. I, I don't see that in a region where you've got tens of thousands of transactions. Yeah, but those, those, that's going to be attracting competition for bonding, and um, and and so it's like if the more revenue there is, the more bonds there are. So that the ratio of the revenue to the bonds is some like risk-adjusted rate of return. Yeah, no, no, but you've got some kind of delta before you. Or are you saying that there's constant rotation of validators? Well, um, that feels scary I mean, to me too. I, I, I mean, I personally like constant rotation of validators, but I usually, but it's not at a super high rate. I don't rotate, you know. But I don't. That, I don't think that's really what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, um, okay, definitely, uh, validators are going to bond in, in, as a function of their expected return. Yeah. And if there's a high expected return on a particular shard, and they have the freedom to bond there, then that ex that expected return should be driven down to like the normal kind of risk-adjusted rates. So, okay, so are, are you saying... The, equal, the market as it drives can, towards they, equilibrium the, the, will... The, the, the will, validators will, can, will can kind of rush out. into a region and fill it up? Yeah, if, there's, if it's very profitable to go that region, you'll, you'll the, maybe not increase the validators, but the, there, there should be more bonding. At very least, there should be more bonding. Right. So the kind of idea is like, oh, doesn't that run counter to the whole like you're assigned? You know, like so you go to the protocol and you say I well, want to buy. Well, well, you don't necessarily yeah, go so, to that so of course. region. Well, but 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 in that case, then the your it's still gonna be your expected profit and uh, that and, and and basically if you have the so the expected profit of anyone who has the capability of being assigned to that profit uh, that shard that just became more profitable will yeah. now have the incentive to buy a little more. So if you so it's still the same it's still the same calculus where but the expectation is a little different because now you have to think about the odds that you're assigned to that chart or that namespace rather. So but still you're going to bond as a function of your expected return and if a chart is particularly value, valuable then it's going to drive up uh, uh, people's expected return at least some of them mm. and then that will drive up bonding right increase in fees. Increases bonding. I actually also want to deploy a contract if it's got a large amount of money attached to it. I want to put it in a place where I know the validators are expected to 
higher security like more volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah more. I'm not gonna take off with my money. Yeah. <sighs> no, I, it just it just feels to me like in, even in that setting, if you have a, a high enough transaction rate, even though the transaction fees are relatively low, the validator can come in, rake, you know, like double their stake. Oh, I mean, and you know, I'm gone. If, there, if there's if there's if there was if there's no competition, um, and the, the fees because the fee, because the fees are sudden and no one has time to react, maybe, but like somehow, like you it, like ideally you'd have validators be competing for these fees so that the amount of deposits are essentially earning fees as an interest rate. Um, oh, as okay, if, that's what I'm. That's what I was thinking is that it's an interest rate. So yeah, yeah so it has to be. There has to be a set of relationships, right, between... Well, well, there is, right? I mean, the amount of bonding will be such that the revenue divided by the interest rate is the amount of bonding. Yeah, right. Uh, at, at least, you know, in aggregate and for, uh, uh, you know, for any kind of class of shards where people have the ability to freely enter or join. So whether that's, you know, the whole system or a particular shard, um, you know, the fact oh, that okay, so I think it. we're saying I think we're now now saying the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but the, but I think the way that, that that's modulated is you could be different, right? One of them is how how many people show up to bond, and the other is how many fees you let out. Right? You can say, oh look, uh, I want to make target this interest rate by, and I'm going to do it by withholding fees, or or you could try to not target it and assume that it'll happen with amount of bonding that shows up, which sort of say is like easier to do. It's like easier to just. Let 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 validator show up. Hi, Kate. What's up? Anyways, it's five to four. Five to four. We can take. You should enter now. I would love to have a break. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And then meet downstairs for the breakout call. Great.